George Gelstar, Chapter 4, Morio. To get from Nishiakatsuki to Morio in the middle of the day took a good six hours, even using planes, trains and buses in the most efficient combination available. By car it was about 650 kilometres, which would take roughly the same amount of time. I was told of Tsukumajuku's death at half six in the morning, so Tsukumajuku must have headed there shortly after I left him at the hospital. I would be pretending not to be interested, or he'd found some reason to care after I left. That or someone else had taken him to Morio to kill him, or after killing him. Although the corpse of a 16-year-old boy wasn't exactly easy to transport. How he got there wasn't the only problem. The body of a 16-year-old male wasn't small, and Tsukumajuku's body had remained largely intact. His throat had been slit so deep only a single layer of skin kept his head attached. He was found naked, wrapped only in a red diamond-shaped cloth. There was a broad axe slung over his shoulder, and he was found mounted on a bear. The scene was arranged to look like something out of the folktale Kintaro. Ever since I left Fuku, the lyrics to the Kintaro's children's song had been on an endless loop in my head. This was completely inappropriate, of course. The killer didn't arrange the scene like a joke. I think. I got off the train at Morio Station shortly after 1pm and looked over the map of the town posted just outside the station gates. Deja vu. Had, but had I been here before? I was sure I hadn't. Tohoku had the famous Nabahage detective and he pretty much handled all of the cases that required someone like him, so I'd never been called up here. In elementary school we went to Nyara and Kyoto and in junior high we went to Tokyo, so this was my first trip up north. There were no tall buildings anywhere around the station, but there was a lot of foot traffic and rows of nicely turned out shops and cafes. It was both peaceful and lively. The city had been well planned. There were no telephone poles in sight and plenty of rooms for pedestrians and cars. There was a car stumping for the upcoming election in the roundabout by the station, but they kept the speaker volume to a respectable level. Kumotaku, Morio's son. Kumotaku, star of the north. Kumoi Takumu asked for your vote. I was hungry, so I stopped to buy a restaurant near the station had the miso tongue beef, a local delicacy apparently. It was good. Beef tongues both thick and softer than I'd imagined, Sukumajuku. May you rest in peace. When I finished eating, I took stock of my emotional state. I'd only known Sukumajuku a few hours since I'd witnessed his entrance into our world, and was basically the only person alive he knew. There'd be nobody else to report his death to, and I was basically here to bury him. In light of this, I decided not to try the sweet sesame dumplings the stall near station was hell-bent on convincing tourists to buy. I hailed a taxi and headed for the Arrow Cross House, where my strange visitor's body had been found. Morio was in a gentle valley, and once we left the shopping area, we passed through a residential area and soon found ourselves in farmland. The road led through fields towards the sea. As we reached the water... Round hills grew more common, and its topography continued into the water. There were a great number of tiny islands dotting the shallow sea. For a moment they looked like a group of umobozus peeking out of the water. It was quite striking, and tourism friendly, as the tour boats sailing in and out of the harbour demonstrated. There were a number of souvenir shops, inns and restaurants lining the docks. The Arrow Cross House stood on top of a round hill, the biggest hill around, and the closest to the water with a fantastic view of the sea and harbour. White walls and a flat roof framed against the blue sky, making it look like a dainty little museum. As my taxi reached the top of the hill, I saw the building's owner standing outside. He was a manga artist named Rohan Kashibi. He was supposedly in his thirties, but to my surprise he looked barely out of his teens. I don't read a lot of manga and had never really read anything by him, but I knew the name. The Pink Dark Boy series had been running for 20 years and had recently started part 8. I got out of the taxi, said hello and apologised for not being familiar with his work. Then let me show you my art, he said, and his finger went <laughs> through the air in front of my eyes, sketching a mysterious boy in a broad brimmed hat. Not only was I able to make out what he was drawing in the air, I was apparently so impressed with the quality of his life, it felt like I'd been struck by lightning and froze to the spot unable to move. I think I even passed out for a moment. I don't know if this surprised him or disappointed him, but he gave me a dubious frown, and then said, I'll show you around the Arrow Cross. I purchased it quite recently, and I've only lived here six months. Of all the rotten luck. 
Here I was, happy to have acquired a bizarre building. It gets used for a murder. What a cliché. I suppose I have to turn it into something worthwhile, but I can't just write the details of a real case into my manga. Or should I be more concerned about finding a place to stay until the case is solved? He spoke very quickly and frequently changed subjects. Clearly conversing with him was going to be a workout. I doubt it. It's a big enough house you won't necessarily need to use the room where the body was found, and there seem to be plenty of entrances. I see. Good. I suppose both Agatha Christie and Ellery Queen both show everyone living normally in the house after a murder, even though staying together just leads to more murders. I always assumed that was forced by the needs of the plot, and would never happen in real life, but I suppose we all believe that one murder is enough to end things, and nothing bad will ever happen to us. And it's such a pain to find a new place to live. Even now someone has been murdered, I find myself quite grateful I can keep living here. In my line of work, I've known plenty of people who fought like this and then got murdered. I decided not to mention it. Our feet scrunching on the gravel, we did a circuit of the building. There were no bushes or flower beds, but with this view they hardly seemed necessary. This is a spectacular view, well Hans son. With a view like this at home, I can see why you wouldn't want to switch to some dumpy hotel. Below us you could see the white sands of Moriel Pearl Beach and countless tiny islands out in Moriel Harbour. Rohan glared at me, muttering, Rohan's son, several times. Crap, did I get his name wrong? It was Rohan Kashibi, right? Nobody calls me Rohan, son, he said at last. Pardon me, Rohan sensei, I said hastily. No, that's not what I mean, he exploded. There's no need to call me sensei whatsoever. I shudder at the very thought that someone might think I wanted that. I'm simply not at all used to being addressed by the family name. My editors, readers, and even the bank clerks down in town just call me Rohan. Ru, manga artist, sure, uh, eccentric, I guess. What he was saying wasn't that out there, but the over-the-top eruption of emotion certainly made him one to watch out for. Uh, but, no buts allowed, he screamed, and went <laughs> with his fingers again, drawing that boy. And once again, I was super impressed. Had I become a huge fan of his quickly, or did Rohan's art have some sort of special power? Eh? Rohan? You can no longer call me anything but Rohan. What? The word refused to come out. I was trying to address him by his family name, but only his given name would come out. What was this? This was weird, right? Was something wrong with me? Rohan turned the grin to me. Please. It's but a small change. Don't worry about it. You're here to solve this murder. Do your job. I have my own job to do, and until the Arrow Cross case is solved, I'll be forever pre preoccupied with police interviews and people investigating the scene. Like I'm made of time. What did he mean? Don't worry about it. So he did do something to me? What? He'd just drawn a sketch in the air and made me go Vzz. But not just that. He'd done something else. Something that changed me. What did that mean? This was very strange. Something bizarre was happening. Something I didn't yet understand. I'd have to be on my guard around Rohan. Like the name Arrow Cross House implies, the building was shaped like a cross, with each point shaped like an arrow. There was no dedicated front door. Each of the arrows had two doors, and any of the eight could be used to get inside. The Arrow Cross is a strange sort of house, Rohan said. It appeared five years ago, without any of the neighbours noticing the construction, despite the size of it. For three years before that, a different house stood here, so to build this one, they would have had to knock the old one down, or at the very least, remodel it considerably. But no permits were ever filed. Furthermore, this house is clearly visible from the harbour, and anyone glancing upwards would have seen people working on it. Yet somehow, the Arrow Cross was built without anyone noticing. This is quite a mystery, wouldn't you say? Not only were there no permits for construction, there is no record of sale for the land. It was officially owned by the city of Morio, and construction was done illegally. They spent some time attempting to locate the owner. When they gave up and decided to tear it down, I stepped in and offered to purchase it. My previous residence had just burned down, you see. This place is perfect. It's quiet here, and the house itself is fascinating. I love not knowing who built it or why. Now, the house that stood here before this one was a very simple square building, but it was also bizarre. It had no windows or doors, no visible entrance at all. 
I'm sure there was an entrance hidden somewhere. After all, if there was a sunroof or, or whatever, you'd never know from downhill. Although that does beg the question of why they'd wish to obscure such a glorious view. And any anyway, right, that square house. The neighbours called it the Cube House. Supposedly was moved here from a town called Nishiak Katsuki in Fuku. How that rumour got around without anyone having any idea who owned the house, nobody knows. Eh? Nishiak Katsuki? That's where I, I'm from. I know, Rohan purred. How did he know? It was the police who had called me to let me know Sukumajuku was dead, and when I'd called Rohan, I'd have no reason to mention my current address. I suppose he could have heard my name on the news, but I was a minor, and had already had death threats from several psychos, so the most specific information available given about me was always from Fuku. Or did Rohan have connections with the police or those in power that could get him that kind of information this quickly? Whatever. I was more concerned with what the fact that Tsukumajuku had been murdered here, in a house that had been transported from Nishi Akatsuki, actually meant. Did you know there's been more than one detective murdered in this town? Well, Han suddenly asked. More than one? Really? I suppose you wouldn't know. The first one happened in the middle of the night. The news has only just started talking about it. You wouldn't have had much chance to watch TV on your way here, either. Tell me, was that boy... The one killed in my arrow cross. Was he a detective too? He had said he was. Yes, although he was from far away. And what fifteen and what cases he handled? I knew perfectly well. He'd solved fifteen locked room murders in 1904 in the Canary Islands in another world. But bringing that up here would just confuse things. I'm not sure, but he was definitely a detective. I see. So then he's one of the serial detective murders. Who else was killed? Do detectives all know each other? If it might come as a blow to you, perhaps we should step inside and let you sit down first? I'll be fine. The only detective I've met is Suku Majuku. Oh, in that case. A man named Hakokuyuku Sachiari, and a girl with a very strange name. Neko Neko Nyan Nyan Nyan. I'd heard of both. They were both Tokyo detectives. We stood outside one of the Arrow Cross's doors, and Rohan told me how Hako Yuku had been found across Morio Harbour at Boingi Cape, seated on a giant stuffed sea turtle. Neko Neko had been found in town, near a strange shaped stone called Angelo Rock, su surrounded by stuffed dogs, cats, and pheasants. Hako Yuku had died of alcohol poisoning. A large quantity of sake had been injected into his bloodstream. Neko Neko had suffocated from the massive quantity of dumplings jammed down her throat. They'd clearly been made to look like Yuashima Taro and Momo Taro, while Sukumajuku was Kin Taro. A serial killer killing detectives, that meant I might be targeted too. Let me show you to the scene. The forensic people have been and gone. I've looked it all for following myself, but didn't touch anything. Rohan took me through a door on the east side of the Arrow Cross. Inside was a large triangular sunroom, with large bay windows on both exterior sides and the ceiling. The walls and floor were all painted white. It was rather bright. All the furniture was in exquisite taste, and were it not for the bed in the middle, you could easily mistake it for a furniture store, or an unusually elegant manga shop. There were books on the table, shelves and floor, but not the books of photographs or other decorative books you'd see in furniture stores. They were all manga. Feel free to keep your shoes on anywhere in the house, this is the east sunroom, which I use as a bedroom, Rohan said, leading me out into a carpeted hallway. It had no windows, so the moment the door to the sunroom closed, it seemed very dark indeed. I had the silhouette of the bed and cabinets burned into my eyes, and had to blink furiously the whole length of the hall. Doors to either side led to the bathroom and toilet. At the end of the hall was a very large square room at the centre of the Arrow Cross house. Every house I'd ever been to used large open rooms like this as a place to entertain company. But not this one. This is where I work, Rohan said, leading me in. It was at least twice the size of the sunroom. Windowless, dark and gloomy, with nothing in it but a single tiny desk perched right in the middle. There were pens and ink on the desk, arranged in neat rows. The walls were bare, with only the doors leading to the other arrows, breaking the monotony. The only lights came from the chandelier on the ceiling and the smaller lamp on the desk. With such a great view, aren't you tempted to work in one of the sunrooms? I asked. Not at all, Rohan snorted. Much too bright, and my work requires no view. Okay then. I could swear he'd grumbled about the cube house wasting the view, but whatever. 
Rohan led me across his study, down another hall and into the north sunroom, the scene of the crime. The light hit my eyes, which felt like they'd been slapped by the soft hands of a child. It had seemed bright when I entered his bedroom, but now it actively hurt. Walking through the dark halls and workroom hadn't helped, but there was also nothing in this sunroom except for the giant bear. The bear's brown fur and the blood stains on its back and the floor, Sukumajuku's blood, presumably, were almost a relief in the sea of white. I looked over what was left of the Kintaro display, waiting for my eyes to adjust to the light. I don't use either this room or the southern one. This one gets too cold in winter, and the south one gets too hot in summer. I only need a bedroom and a workroom to begin with. At most, a guest room for editors to stay in when they come to see the sights, Rohan said, shielding his eyes from the light. The murder itself doesn't bother me. I'd like to clean the place. The police won't let me. Have to keep the scene intact, they say. They took your friend's body and the axe with them. The bear was so big they left it here, but they'll be back for it eventually. Yesterday and last night they found two other dead detectives, and then this morning a third your friend. They're rather busy. They're forming a special team to deal with things. I had them leave a copy of the crime scene photographs and the forensic data, if you'd like to see it. He had them leave it. What led to this arrogant streak? It didn't seem to be just a personality thing. It was like he'd gotten used to the world bending to his will. I did want to see the photographs, though. Rohan bought a notebook computer, rested it on his arm, and showed me the screen. I took a closer look. Tsukumajuku's handsome visage was ashen. He was seated on the bear's back, and both his body and the axe were wrapped in wire, fixing them in place. He was leaning slightly to the right, I think. His head was tilted in that direction, leaving the gaping wound on display to his left. I could tell Rohan was studying my reaction to these images, but it didn't bother me. He didn't mean to be insensitive. He simply wasn't aware how transparent his expressions and body language were. We may not have known each other long, but it was already clear Rohan was an odd bird, but not a bad one. Notice anything, detective? He asked with a mocking lilt. Then again, he always sounded like that, so I didn't take offence. From the state of his body, nothing of note. Oh, nothing about the Kintaro thing? The others are Urashima Taro and Momotaro, of course. True, and I'm supposed you have pictures of those crime scenes too. I do. Impressive deduction, detective, I suppose. Rohan quickly opened more images on the screen. But why would the killer pose them like this? It's hardly a professional opinion, but it seems like rather a lot of work. Gathering all the stuffed animals, decorating them, even matching the method of murder to the theme. If you had the bear already, then the dogs, monkeys and pheasants would be easy to get. Even the sea turtle must not be that hard to find in a port town like this. But getting a stuffed bear is quite tricky. There's no bears around here. That's why they had to use a polar bear. And finding the polar bear was likely the inspiration for the whole stunt. Polar bear? This is a polar bear. Rohan asked. You didn't notice? Small head, long neck? It's obvious. Ursus Maritimus, the polar bear. The scientific name was given by John Phipps in 1774. Huh. That should narrow down the owner then, even more than owning a normal stuffed bear. But this is your bear, isn't it? Heavens no! There are no polar bears in my manga. If there was, I might consider buying one, but more likely I'd just go to the zoo, or find some place with a stuffed one on display. No need to own it personally. Do they even sell stuffed polar bears anywhere? The Washington Convention doesn't specifically forbid the sale of them. Polar bears are lifted in Appendix 2. That means it's up to the country of origin whether to grant permission to export them. There were plenty available before the convention existed, so I'd imagine they're obtainable if one desires. But you didn't buy one, Rohan? No. Decorating with animal corpses is not my style. I see. Getting a stuffed animal this size into your house would be very difficult. It would take several people, I'd have noticed. The murder happened here late last night or early this morning. Did you go out at all? Of course not. I was drawing until 2am, then slept until just before dawn. I usually sleep until sunrise, but I woke a little early this morning. Dawn. It starts getting light around 5am this time of year. Sunrise yesterday was at 20 past 5 a.m. I sleep in a sunroom. Early rising is inevitable. I've never really needed a great quantity of sleep. Three hours is plenty. <laughs> I've heard manga artists are always busy. 
By the same token, I don't suppose you were so exhausted you would have fallen into such a deep sleep you could have failed to notice a group of intruders? It seemed unlikely, but was worth verifying. No, no. It may come as a surprise to you, but I'm quite high-strung. I'm not saying I'd rake at a pin drop, but I can't see how someone bringing a giant stuffed animal in would escape my notice. How could that possibly be a surprise to me? He might as well have it written on his shirt. But if they put it on a cart or something, and moved it quietly into the house? Quietly depends on how quietly. I would like to work in silence, and there are sound absorption panels everywhere. If they were moving it from one room to another, it's possible I wouldn't notice. But from outside, no normal human could ever do it. You walked around the house with me. Our cross is surrounded by gravel, as an anti-theft mechanism. No normal human could cross it without making a sound. Anyone delivering a bear would have made a tremendous racket. Last night, I certainly may have been more exhausted than usual. After all, I somehow managed to pick the wrong bedroom. The difference in the morning sky was what woke me early. The wrong bedroom? Yes, my bedroom's in the east sunroom, the room we came in by. But this morning, I was sleeping in the west sunroom. How could that happen? You work in the centre room, and your desk's right in the centre of it, right? Yes. Your desk faces north, so south's behind you, and east and west are to the right and left. Simple. You've been living here for six months. Hardly seems likely you walked in the wrong direction. But apparently I did. I like to keep things orderly, you see. I cannot bear things that aren't symmetrical. That's part of the reason I purchased the Arrow Cross. The east and west sunrooms have exactly the same furniture, arranged in exactly the same way. Beautiful symmetry is always a product of human ingenuity. Symmetry is the basis of man-made beauty. <laughs> We're talking point symmetry rather than line symmetry then. Hmm? No, line symmetry. The rooms are mirror images of each other. Then something even strange is happening here. The placement of furniture in the two rooms is reversed. You'd notice the moment you open the door. Yet you fell asleep without noticing? Hmm. Did you get in bed without turning on the light? No, I turned it on, got in bed, and pressed the switch near my pillow. Do you drink much? I ingest nothing after 9pm, and I may have a drink on occasion, but never to excess. I guess these mistakes just happen. After all, I'm not the only one who made this mistake last night. Someone else did. Who? My guest. I'm letting her stay here for the time being. So there was someone else here last night with you? Mind telling me more? I'll introduce you, of course, but please don't mention her to anyone else. She's still in high school. If word got around she was staying at the home of an older bachelor, well, that would be a shame, wouldn't it? She has her reasons. Like, she remembers nothing but her name, Amnesia. So severe, even I can't read her past. So I have her help look after the place while she tries to uncover her past and waits for her memories to return. <laughs> you didn't know her before? Not in the least. She's maybe a bit older than you. Showed up shortly after I moved here. I never imagined myself capable of living with anyone, but I couldn't just throw her out on the street. And she seemed like a nice girl. We're getting along well. What's her name? Remy Sugimoto.